Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Aspire, JFN's annual High Holiday Gathering. More than ever before, our community needs to come together, and I am thrilled that over 100 people have registered to join us today, and have chosen to take the time to hear wisdom from religious and communal thought leaders on Jewish ethics. The holidays are a time for reflection, inspiration, and connection. And at this year's program, we're showcasing the co-authors of an exciting new ethics column from Sapir, Ideas for a Thriving Future, a journal published by JFN member Maimonides Fund. We'll learn more about the speakers in a moment, but in conversation moderated by JFN member Barry Feinstone, um, President and CEO Jim Joseph Foundation, and Rabbi David Wolpe, and Rabbi Yaffa Epstein, we will explore how we can apply Jewish wisdom to ethical dilemmas faced in Jewish communal life. And now I would like to introduce Andre Spaconi, President and CEO of Jewish Funders Network to continue to frame today's program. Thank you, Andres. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. And thank you, uh, Barry, Rabbi Yaffa, and, and, and David to, uh, to, to, to lead us in this, in this wonderful conversation. Um, just a word before we before we go about what it is that we're doing with these gatherings uh, pre high holidays. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a, a story I heard one about uh, flying fish. You know, this fish, this fish that jump out of the water. And and somebody observed that when it's raining, those fish jump out of the water to try to catch drops of rainwater. And somebody said, well, that's kind of weird because like they live in water. Why do they have to jump to try to catch more water? And, and uh, but I find it as a beautiful metaphor of what we're trying to do. We, we live among issues and problems and, and dilemmas in the Jewish community. And what we're trying to do in these, in these gatherings is to jump out of them and try to see, see them from, from a different height, from a different perspective. And this is a little bit what the high holidays are all about, uh, really trying to elevate the conversation that we have with ourselves, uh, looking at it in a different, from a different perspective and appreciate, you know, like, like those fish appreciate the water differently as they jump out of it. So maybe we can appreciate also the, the wisdom of the richness of our community when we jump out of it for a minute and try to analyze it um, from a different perspective. Uh, that's why these uh, events, uh, these pre-high holidays events are a little different than the ones we do with Jeff and regularly. Uh, you may be used to Jeff and events that deal with the methodological aspect of grant making, impact investing, evaluation, you name it. Or you may be used to Jeff and events that deal with a specific funding field, learning about I don't know, Haredi Jews, Arab Israelis, anti-Semitism, Jewish education, you name it. This is a little different. This, this, um, in these events, we're trying to, you know, uh, piggyback on the spirit of the high holidays, of more reflection, of more in-depth analysis of, 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 of our community. And, and that's the idea behind, behind uh, Aspire, is provide is, is to attempt to provide funders with a deeper dive on, on some of the current issues, uh, looking at them from a more, um, I would say, um, ethically informed perspective rather than a methodological perspective. This is not about programs, this is about thinking who we are, who we wanna be, and, and how do we wanna live our lives together. Uh, and of course, as funders, we need to walk the talk and we need to model this type of conversations and this type of in-depth uh, analysis of, of things that are happening in day to day. So with that introduction, I'm gonna give the floor to my dear friend, Barry Feinstone, um, that is gonna take us uh, in, this, in this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, when uh, when Andres reached out to ask me if I was moderate uh, this conversation, uh, my first question was, well, who's in the conversation? And when I discovered that it was uh, Rabbi Yaffa and uh, Rabbi David, uh, two friends and colleagues, uh, 
um, I realized that I would have probably have the easiest job in the Jewish community today, which is to frame a couple of things and uh, simply get out of the road, which I will plan to do uh, in a relatively expeditious, uh, expeditious manner. Um, it is a pleasure to be with uh, everybody here today and especially to, to the both of you. Um, uh, rabbi David Wolpe is the uh, Max Weber Senior Rabbi at Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. And Rabbi Yaffa Epstein is the senior scholar and educator in residence at the Jewish Education Project. Um, uh, it, there will be links uh, coming up. There they are right now in the chat with uh, with their with their bios. Uh, should you uh, want to delve in a little bit more to these two wonderful leaders in our community? Um, we're going to begin the conversation today uh, by asking um, Rabbi David Wolpe and then Rabbi uh, Yaffa Epstein to share um, a personal uh, vidui moment as we head into the uh, the, the the Rosh Hashanah um, Yom Kippur um, time span of our of our of our of our life, and. Uh, just for those of you who may or may not be familiar with uh, with Vidui, um, Vidui is a is a prayer that is, that is set that is, that is common to be said as death approaches. Since since ancient days, it has been part of a Jewish tradition that one would want to return to God in the same state of ritual purity and and innocence, if you will, as when one is born. And in order to accomplish this, it has become traditional for an individual to offer a final confession shortly before their death. The Hebrew term for which is vidui. Um, you will sure recognize this term from the Yom Kippur liturgy. In most cases, vidui is offered by a rabbi on behalf of the person as death approaches, but it can also be offered by individuals themselves if they are, if they are so inclined or by a, by a family member. And it, and it is with that frame that uh, as we were planning this conversation, that uh, bef that what better way to perhaps model, um, you know, some some civil conversations and by by reflecting on the transgression transgressions that uh, that that each of us have made um, throughout the year. Um, and for myself um, on a daily basis um, in, in trying to reflect and react towards that. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Rabbi Wolpe um, to, be, to begin that. And then when, the, when David is done, Yaffa will uh, take, on, uh, take that on and then we'll go into a conversation. Welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. I want to also thank you and Andres and of course, my colleague, uh, Yaffa Epstein, um, we all actually really are friends. Uh, and, and I think both Yaffa and I have learned a lot from each other. We do think a little bit differently, which is what makes the ethics column so interesting, I think, and uh, so productive and fruitful. And it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to start, to jumpstart the thinking about uh, our own faults and texts that reflect it, which is what we're going to do. Um, we're each gonna share a text and how it plays into our own issues that we grapple with. Uh, and I want to also, I want to begin by just reminding everyone that the vidui that Barry very eloquently described also happens in the daily service, which means that because there's a vidui every day, we all sin every day, presumably by omission or commission. We don't say nice things that we could. We do say unnice things that we shouldn't. Um, so it doesn't have to be the greatest, heaviest sin you have ever committed to, to talk about Vidui before Yom Kippur, although Yom Kippur itself does very much focus on the fact that none of us know when all of this will be over. And you're supposed to try to cleanse your soul as much as possible because death is an ever-present possibility in every life. Um, the text that I've chosen, I'm going to jump right into it. I'm just going to describe it to you because for most of you, maybe all of you, it's very familiar. Uh, but I hope that the conclusions I draw will be a little bit novel for you. Um, and it's the text where Jacob, you'll recall, steals the birthright from his brother. Um, we're not going to get into the ethics of that, but he does. He fools his old blind father, and then he has to run away from home. And years later, after he's gone through a lot of experiences, he discovers that his brother, whom he betrayed, is coming with 400 men, which can only mean he's coming to kill him. So the night before, he sends everybody off 
And he has this episode, Jacob does, of wrestling with an angel. And the, he gets hold of the angel, and angels, for some reason, at least in this story, although angels do appear during the daytime in other stories, this angel is like a vampire. He says, you know, you have to let me go before the day breaks, or presumably I'll melt like the Wicked Witch. I'm editorializing a little bit. Uh, so Jacob says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the angel says to him, your name was Jacob. What, is, what, what was your name? And he, now the reason the angel asked him his name um, is because remember Jacob fooled his father about what his name really was earlier. So he wants to first see if Jacob will fess up and tell, stand up and be who he is. Because part of the Vidui process, of course, is recognizing who you are before you can change who you are. So Jacob says, my name is Jacob. And the angel says, no, now your name is Israel. He changes his name to Israel because you have gone through this great uh, experience of wrestling with divine beings and you have survived and even prevailed. So I want to say two things about this story and then a quick word about how uh, I internalize it in my own life. The first is many, many, many times as a rabbi, people have come to me for blessings. They want health. They want prosperity. They want blessings for children. If someone came to me for a blessing, whose name was Seymour, and I said, your name is now Fred. I don't think that they would say, yes, that's the blessing I was searching for, right? It's a very strange thing that the angel does. He doesn't say you will succeed, you will grow, you will have children, you'll have longevity. No, he says you have a different name. But of course, the deeper message here is self-transcendence, that who you are today doesn't have to be who you are tomorrow. And that this determinism of character is very un-Jewish, that we really do believe that people can change. That's what this time of year is all about. And the second thing, which I literally just realized in thinking about this presentation, and I've never said this before, and I'm sure someone else has said it, but I've never seen it, is most of the time when we think we're wrestling with the things that are bad in our character, we think, of us as, we think of ourselves as wrestling with dark sides or with devils. But most of the time we're really wrestling with angels, just like Jacob was, because it's the positive traits in you taken to a place they shouldn't go that actually end up upending us. And I think what Jacob was, I mean, Jacob was obviously incredibly gifted human being but he used his gifts of charisma sometimes for deception, but he had to wrestle with his own angels to become who he was. And I think that that's a model for a lot of us. Um, sometimes like if you're nice with somebody, you can cross boundaries. Sometimes if you're smart, you can make other people feel inadequate. Sometimes on and on and on, if you work really hard, you can drive yourself into the ground and neglect your family. And all these things are about wrestling with angels. So I grew up in a family. I was actually uh, uh, telling uh, all the participants uh, before we began, I grew up in a family where everybody argued and it was great. I had three brothers and my father who basically moderated and my mother who only stepped in when we really got out of line. Um, but I learned as a result the joy of contention, like Talmudic argument, and, and also, of course, if you made someone laugh, you won. Um, so there were jokes and there were arguments, and, and the Shabbos dinner table when I was growing up is, I still think of as like the best place that I ever was in my childhood. It was, it was glorious. But sometimes I carry that same tendency into the world, and it's not always so good. And I remember this year, I had an argument with someone. Uh, it was about Israel. And the other person wasn't that far away from where I was, but I got so upset and so reactive that I literally had to walk out of the room in order to calm myself in front of a whole group of people. And afterwards I felt ashamed of myself because I thought like, really, you can't, you couldn't like for a moment, take a deep breath and say, okay, so that's your point of view and just accept it. And I couldn't in part because I grew up with this tradition of contention that I had then taken way too far. And I had to wrestle with my own angels. I feel that sometimes when I'm on social media, but on social media, I step back much better sometimes than I do in person. And so 
one of the things that I want to think about, and I encourage you to think about, um, is not just the tendencies in you that you think are bad, but how do the tendencies in you that you think are good sometimes upend the ethical goals that you believe to be important? And uh, with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Rabbi Epstein. Thank you so much, David. That was so beautiful. Um, I love that it's re we're really re wrestling with the angels and not the devils. It's beautiful. Um, I also wanted to say thank you so much uh, to everyone for having me, uh, to JFN for having having us on this panel, and uh, what an honor it is to be sitting with these uh, illustrious colleagues. I do want to say also one more note of thanks. Um, how how joyous it is to have these conversations about ethics. Um, through the lens of Jewish text. I think it really deepens the conversation in such a, in such a beautiful way. So I, I feel very grateful that we're doing that with JFN and also that we get to do that, uh, David, that we get to do that with, uh, with Sapir. I'm, I'm really grateful about that. So I wanted to, and I'm gonna ask um, Alana to pop this onto the, onto the screen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a Talmudic text, one of my favorite, although I do say that they say that about them all, that's the truth, um, which describes a conversation uh, between Bruria, who is one of the few female Talmud, Talmudists or really rabbis who are named in the Talmud. And Alana, if you could just go down a tiny drop more to right to the top where it says there were some hooligans. Perfect, thank you so much. So this is a text which um, describes a conversation between Bruria and her husband, Rebbe Meir, who is one of the most important rabbis in, um, in the Mishnah and in Talmudic tradition. And basically, Rabbi Meir walks into his house one day and he starts to pray. And he's, his prayer is about these bad guys who live in his neighborhood who he really doesn't like. And the text tells us cause him a great deal of anguish, anguish, okay? So accordingly, like any good rabbi, when you don't like your congregants or you don't like your neighbors, you pray that they die, right? No, of course not, you would never, hire anyone or anyone want any leader who prayed for people they didn't like to die. It's a pretty extreme position. So his wife sort of hears this and here's what he's doing and says to him, what are you thinking, right? How could you pray for the death of these people? But she's very charitable to him and she says, oh, I know, I know. You must be basing this on a text. I know you're a very rational person. You must have a text to prove what you're thinking about. It must be this verse from Psalms 104, which says, let sin cease from the land, although the actual JPS translation in our world actually says sinners. But basically her point here is, you must be basing yourself on a text which says, let sinners cease from the land. But she says to him, actually, you should read the text better and read the text not as chot'im, sinners cease from the land, but rather sins. And then she says, and let's go down just a tiny little drop. Moreover, she says, look to the end of the verse, which says, and the wicked will be no more. If you pray, if, if you, if we believe that sins will cease, I won't have any more wicked people, okay? And then she says to him the following piece of Musa, the following piece of moral advice, she says to him, don't pray that they die, pray that they should repent, as if they repent, then the wicked will be no more. And lo and behold, my friends, when the mayor prays for them, that they should repent and they do indeed repent. Okay, so that's sort of the story. We can pause there, Lana, you can take the text down. Thank you all for, uh, for having a look at that. And what we're, we're sort of learning in this text, I think two interesting things. One, that Rabbi Mayer reacted so strongly to these people. The text is down now, but I'll just, just take my word for it. The Hebrew there says, biryonim, okay? Which is translated as transgressors or hooligans, but actually, it really comes from the word zealot and really is describing, and I think this is very important for our world, someone that I really disagree with at a political and social level. It's not just, I don't like these guys, they play their music too loud and they keep beer cans on the front lawn. That's not what we're talking about here, right? They are actually people that I deeply disagree with their political views. So for me, one of the things I love about this text, besides just having this incredible female scholar who corrects her husband through text, which in and of itself is worth talking about. But besides that, I like really relate to Rabbi Mayer, <laughs> I have to say, because not that I want anyone to die, God forbid, and not that I think people should die because they disagree with me, God forbid. But I do think that that emotional reaction to people who are different than me is so real. 
And I also think, and this is where my, my confession will come in, that we have a tendency, and I do too, to boil people down to just their views, to just their perspectives, to what they believe, rather than seeing them as a whole person. And Bruria says to Mayor, what are you thinking? You, you're boiling these people down. You're letting go of their humanity. So I'll just share in a very personal way that um, for me, most of my teens and 20s, and I really tried to work on this, I would ask people about what they thought about women in Judaism. Basically any person, not just man, any person I met, I was like, what do you say about women in Judaism? And particularly women in Orthodox Judaism. That's where I come from. <laughs> and based on their answer, I would decide you're moral, you're immoral. It was very clear. So I'd like to pretend that I don't do that anymore. That was just my 20s, but of course I do. And, uh, and that's something that I really struggle with is trying to move past someone who I deeply disagree with their perspective, with their views, and maybe even their behavior. I disagree with it. And I try I, I, and boiling them down to just everything about them becomes about that. And really trying to look past that and say, who is the whole person here? Where can we connect at a human level? And really, like Bruria says, try to, um, try to, um, pray for them or try to find, I, I, I like to interpret that as try to find their humanity uh, and, and the wholeness of who they are and not just boil them down to this one perspective, this one political belief or this one behavior of theirs. Yasher um, Koach, to, uh, to, 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 to both of you and, you know, um, I'll get to the, the kind of the, the kind of the first leading question in a second, but uh, you know, um, just just a, a a couple of things and, and frames of what you said. Um, you know, you know, first of all, um, Rabbi Wolpe, uh, you know, I appreciate the, very much to the to everybody about the the where you started about the daily bidui, um, and that 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 you know there are, you know, there are, I've 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 actually moved quite a lot in my life, you know, from city to city, and and I've tried to use that as a moment of reinventing of shedding the things that I don't like about myself in a purposeful fashion, because I'm going to a place where nobody knows me. So there is no kind of preconceived uh, you know, <clears throat> notion. And, you know, and it's, you know, it's it maybe easier to do when nobody knows you and harder right. to do, um, you know, when, when you're, when people have, it's kind of the tie into the, the preconceived notion piece that, uh, that Rabbi Epstein, you know, spoke about. So, um, you know, just a, a reminder about the, the, the daily piece of it was, was really instructive. Um, and then I also think, and, and appreciate both of you, you know, just talking, uh, you know, personally about it, that so often, we the conversations that we have about the things that we don't like about ourselves we have with ourselves um or or, or perhaps with our partner you know like with with a it, it, it it's a very it's a it, 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 if it's really anybody else it's a very small tiny group of people um and you know it just strikes me as i was listening to you rabbi epstein about the the kind of the 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 burden that is that might be taken off a shoulder when you actually talk about something publicly to a larger group of people um as opposed to the conversation that goes on inside our each of our heads you know pretty much uh, you know pretty much every day so so thank yeah. you for sharing um, i just want to know am i allowed to quote an irish poet in front of a scotsman you, you of course you are please okay just checking right because yates had a beautiful line about that he said with our arguments with others we make rhetoric with our arguments with ourselves we make poetry yeah yeah so it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, a really beautiful and, and you know my, my takeaway from all of that was like you know you know trying to be more open to others about where i am once right I, you know, that out it, it, yeah. it's, it's really beautiful i um, guess that's how you share your that's how you share your poetry right yeah 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 that's it's really lovely um yeah you can quote yates anytime that's a that's a, <laughs> a, 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 a an all-star all <laughs> <in my opinion. laughs> 
Um, so, so let's kind of dig in just a just a little bit. Um, and 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 you both, you know, mentioned this in different ways in your in your opening um, and 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 your and your and your text. Um, and and you know, here we are, you know, um, coming. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna walk into shul. Um, you know, in in whatever what whatever that looks like for us. You know, synagogue. Chavara, over over our dinner tables, you know, whatever whatever it looks, and sitting across the table or sitting next to us, um, um, you know, at shul is going to be fundament is going to be somebody that we fundamentally, you know, you know, disagree with, right? That we fun, you know, that we have some oppositional thing. H how do we handle that? Well, what what does our text say? How how do we how do we enter into that in a different way? this Rosh Hashanah than perhaps we have done in, in prior ones. And, you know, maybe I'll, we'll start with you, uh, Rabbi Yaffa, um, to, to kick this one off. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Barry. And I agree. All the eights all the time. It's amazing. Um, so um, this, I think, is such an important question. And I think it is something that many of us grapple with. What do I do when I'm really confronted with someone that I'm sitting with that really disagrees? with me fundamentally. And I think, um, you know, I have a, a couple of ways I wanna respond, but I wanna tell a, tell a quick vignette, but I, I'm, I, this is not to get political. So I'm not gonna use any, um, any uh, names, but there was an election at some point. And after that election, uh, I happened to be on a listserv, uh, uh, no, sorry, a Facebook group of people who were for one candidate. That's as much as I'm going to describe. And um, after the candidate that we were rooting for lost the election, somebody wrote, oh, well, there goes Thanksgiving. And someone went, what do you mean? And they're like, well, I can't go home now because my whole family voted for the other person. And I just remember being so heartbroken. Like, forget being heartbroken that the candidate you know, lost. I was heartbroken at that, that expression that now that a certain political candidate had won the election, I could no longer go home to my family and sit with them for Thanksgiving. Now, I just want to clear, I just want to, you know, sort of qualify what I'm saying um, in, in that um, I understand that for some people, home really is dangerous and not everyone's family is safe. And of course, that that's true. I don't mean to talk about those cases. But to me, it seemed like a different case, which was because I disagree with you politically, fundamentally, I can't celebrate the holiday with you. And I just, I just remember feeling so sad about that because I really deeply believe we can't allow that to happen. We cannot allow our Shabbat tables, our Rosh Hashanah tables, our synagogues to become places where I cannot even sit with you. I can't enter these doors if I disagree with your political candidate. We can't allow that to happen. And we're in a time where that is happening and we really have to deeply struggle against that. Um, there's a line um, in the opening Kol Nidre prayer, which is so, I, I think in, for many of us, it's very evocative, like this is the holiday, even though there's a lot to say about that prayer and it's problematic nature, but, but there's a line which basically describes that we are, um, I'm just gonna read it out loud. With the consent of the Almighty and the consent of the congregation, in a convocation of the heavenly court and the convocation of the lower court, anu matirin lehitpalel im ha'avaryanim. We hereby grant permission to pray with the transgressors, right? Which is supposed to be us saying, listen, we know some people here are transgressors. We're going to pray with them. But of course, as Rabbi Wolpe said before, none of us escape sin. And really what we say when we say, oh, let's pray, we're, we're permitted to pray with the transgressors is, we're permitted to pray as transgressors next to my fellow who is also a transgressor. And I think, you know, what we should be thinking about, I, very rarely do I say should, but I really think this is true in our world right now. We really need to be thinking about the fact that we are all transgressors and that it is time to inject some humility into our Shabbat tables. But how do we do that, I think, really is the question. And, um, and, and for this, I, I sort of turn to my, my teacher, um, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who, a blessed memory, who talked about the idea that actually speech 
and speaking about things, the Torah really commands us. You're not allowed to hate your brother in your heart. You're not allowed to pretend like nothing's wrong. And actually, deep down, you're furious, right? You actually have to talk things out. So I think we have to, one, inject some humility into our own positions, understand we're all transgressors. But also, he talks about how we have to use words, the power of speech to heal. The power of, we just talked about our vidui of our confession and the power of that, sharing our poetry. But really, how do we actually confront one another in a way that allows for healing and understanding? But that is only going to happen, I think, with, with deep humility as we go forward. So one of the things that I, I'm struck by is when I was born, the um, percentage of people who would feel comfortable having their children marry someone of another race was very low. But the number of people who would be comfortable having their children marry someone of another political party was very high. That has almost completely reversed in the last half century. Now, the number of people who would be comfortable having their children marry someone of another race is very high. And the people who are comfortable having their children marry somebody of another party has plummeted. In a way, this is a very encouraging statistic because it means that people really can change and things really do change. And we have a very strong bias to the way things are now is the way they will always be. And all this advice is worthless because this is how people are, but it's not true. Uh, a lot of things have changed in my lifetime. I've seen things change very dramatically that people thought would be forever. The day before the Soviet Union collapsed, everybody was sure the Soviet Union would be there forever. And then it was gone. So I do think that these kinds of incremental efforts that Yafa just talked about really do matter. And the first thing as a practical matter that I would say is if you're going to talk about politics at your dinner table, which I think is a bad idea to start with for most families. But if you are, here's the rule I would make. You're only allowed to argue the other side of what you believe. Everybody has to take the other person's position. And that's the rule for the political discussion for the family dinner. Because if you can't articulate as persuasively as possible the position of the other side, then you have no business believing your own side anyway, because you don't know what the other side has to say about it. And the ability to enter the ideas of the other side, and by the way, this is deeply Talmudic. Why does the Talmud preserve all these opinions that are rejected? It doesn't have to. It could just say, this is the conclusion the rabbis came to. But the answer is in part, one, because we all change our minds over the course of history. And so you have to see that the, the arguments that you feel, hold now might change and that you have to be able to empathize with other people, even if they make arguments that you think should change. And second, because to see the worth of all sides of an issue is part of being a rounded human being. Um, I really, I have no patience for people on either side, and this is my own fault, people on either side of the political spectrum who can't for a moment imagine that the other side has any worth whatsoever, anything decent to say whatsoever. Um, and so there is this really important enterprise of, uh, of hearing the context and seeing through the lens of somebody who radically disagrees with you. And then finally, people do change their minds, even about very heartfelt believing things. How many people do you know who started off on one side of the political spectrum when they were young and ended up on the other side? This happens. And so you shouldn't despair of anyone, you know? Um, it's like, you know, the, 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 rabbinic saying and for Kavot that you should repent one day before your death. And then of course, the, the coda to that is since you never know when you die, you should repent every day. But the point is, you're never, as a human being, you're never irredeemably lost. You could always find your way. Now you may have done things that are irredeemable, but that doesn't mean that your heart has to stay the same. Your mind has to stay the same. It can always change. And I think if we believe in the possibility of growth of human beings, um, that also, along with the humility that we just heard about, those two things together 
um, might make us a little bit nicer to each other. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you both. I, I, I was, um, you know, I, obviously we've been thinking about this conversation for a few weeks now and I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in New York um, right now, a long way from San Francisco heading back. But over the weekend, um, I attended uh, the downtown minion um, led by um, um, Michal Biton and, uh, and, and Yehuda Starna. And, um, you know, something, the, the, the space that is rented, uh, you know, in the, in, in the Center for Jewish History, we're sitting there and f looking east, you know, all the way to the East River, but the, we're, we're looking actually at a piece of, a massive piece of art from kind of floor to ceiling of a page of Talmud. Mm -hmm. um, and it can, you know, and it kind of struck me that, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, the, the orientation that we have to the Aaron Kodesh and to the, to the Torah scrolls, which of course is universal and eternal. And I understand, um, but it was kind of like a, a, a reminder about the disagreement, uh, you know, when, when you're praying to a page and you're looking at a page of Talmud in front of you and you're seeing the, you know, you're seeing the outline of the text and then all the commentary are outside. It's kind of like a, a reminder um, about, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 how the rabbis functioned and, and, and kind of the, 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 what is ingrained into our religion about questioning and understanding and taking different sides, you know, you know, it, it, it is in everything. And it, so I just, you know, wanted to um, frame that a little bit. I, I guess, um, you know, we, we, we talked as we, you know, um, you know, again, keeping this as current as we possibly can, um, and I know something that's very much, you know, been on a lot of our minds, on, on Andres's mind as he's been, you know, surveying the uh, the kind of, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the scene, which is that this this taking, um, for want of a better term, taking Jewish texts, you know, uh, you know, recruiting Judaism, you know, to beef up one's own political perspective and, you know, and, and traditions, uh, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily, you know, but I guess I will say almost like weaponizing text in some way um, to, uh, you know, to, to, to push forward, uh, you know, a particular perspective and viewpoint. And I've even seen it happen, you know, in the space of a couple of days where people have used the same text to, 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 to illuminate two completely different viewpoints. Yeah. And I guess I'm, you know, interested in your perspectives and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and responses to that, you know, are, are, are we, are we, are we utilizing these texts in the wrong fashion when we, uh, you know, when we do that in our debates? So I think we disagree about this a little bit. So I'll start and then I'll hear why I'm wrong. Um, so <laughs> first of all, I think it is different if you're a pulpit rabbi than if you're a scholar. Because if you're a pulpit rabbi, your principal obligation is to keep the community together. And as soon as you start to talk politics, doesn't matter which side, you have put a, a D or an R, that is a Democrat or Republican, on top of your congregation, and you've made the rest of the congregation feel disenfranchised in your home. And the only way that works is if you have a completely homogenous congregation. If you don't, then what you've done basically is you've said, this is the way Judaism interprets the tradition. So there really is no place for you here. Um, and I, I strongly feel, and I've had this public debate and people can look it up and there were articles back and forth in the Jewish Journal and other places, that, that pulpit rabbis ought not to talk politics from the pulpit. Now, politics is a very elastic term, right? I mean, in one sense, almost every social and value issue has political ramifications. So if you say something like, you know, we should help alleviate poverty, I suppose that's a political um, question. But there are a lot of issues that rabbis take positions on that they don't know any better than their congregants. And their taking position is basically using the Torah to validate their own political positions. I don't know whether the minimum wage is good or bad or what it should be better than the people in my congregation who study economics for a living. And yet if I stand up there and I say, the Torah says you should pay a worker minimum wage. I have just taken a position for which I have no expertise no definitive comment in the Torah, because you can argue it both ways. 
and I have disenfranchised everybody who disagrees with me. Um, the, the second piece of this, or the third piece of this, God knows how many uh, points I've made in my little rant. The third piece of this is that I know very well, I taught a class at Emmanuel a couple of years ago before the pandemic in which I took big issues, immigration, women's rights, abortion, so on and so forth. And I showed them that Jewish texts can be used to argue both sides. I said, I'm gonna start this. My, I, my ideal is you won't know what I think by the end of the class. You'll just know that I can argue both sides from the texts. So when people say the Torah says you should be this, they're being selective, which is okay. There's nothing, we're all selective, but I think you have to be honest about it. So let me just give one very concrete example so that my cards are on the table and then I will turn it over. I gave a sermon about Roe v. Wade and I thought that the, um, I, I mean, it was essentially, it was a very qualified pro-choice sermon. That is Judaism clearly takes this seriously. It's not equivalent to having a tooth removed, so on and so forth. But I also pointed out in the course of it that you can use these texts to argue lots of different ways. And even the most definitive statement you can make, which is that abortion is not equivalent to murder in almost every Jewish text. There have been some scholars who are really, I would say, extremist on this issue, who say it's basically equivalent to murder. Even though I think the Torah clearly contradicts that view, you can argue that view and still be a scholar. So it's really hard to be definitive on political issues. And I think we should have a certain becoming modesty about using the Torah to dig our own political spades. Just before you respond, uh, uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yaffa, um, if anybody, you know, we might have time for a question or two. If anybody does have something, just you can use the Q&A function at the uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, if not, no worries. We'll, we've got other things, but I uh, just wanted to encourage that in the last uh, 10, 11 minutes. Um, if, if there's something there, we'll, we'll try and do that. Go ahead, Rabbi. Thank you. Yeah, so actually, David, I completely agree with everything you said. Unfortunately, because I wanted to model that we were we could be able to disagree. <laughs> I agree with everything you said, and I also disagree with something. Okay. Because um, because I I think I think you're 100 percent right that when we say Judaism says X, we are by definition ignoring other voices in the tradition. What I do think is not new that we're I think I think it feels like we're in a time where, as you said, Barry, we're weaponizing text or Judaism has become sort of a pawn or Jewish text a pawn in our political um, landscape. But, but what I think is really important to say, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say, if I will be, but is that this is not new. We have, we've been doing, since we have had text, okay. we have been utilizing yeah. text to make our point. That's what we do. In fact, that's part of why I wanted to bring that text of Brian or be mayor, right? Because both of them theoretically had a text, the same text, Rabbi Mayer said, I can use this text to prove I can pray for the death of people I don't like. And Bria says, what? Read that text differently. You should choose to read the text with compassion and not to kill people, right? To actually pray for their repentance. So I, I think that that's a very powerful idea that it, since the, and, and I love, by the way, Barry, I wanna go to any shul where we can pray to the Talmud. I mean, that sounds amazing, but um, <laughs> that's my religion, but, um, but uh, <laughs> But I think if we look at the Talmud, we we today we and I'm I I say this as a fundamentalist pluralist. Okay, I'm a fundamental pluralist, and um, in my core, as for, I, I've started using that term about myself, and I don't know, I'm trying it on. I've never said I was a fundamentalist, <laughs> but I'm a fundamentalist about pluralism, and um, and the and we use the Talmud today in our world to say, see, we have differences of opinion, and they live on the same page. And that is true, and it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things on the Talmud. But it doesn't mean that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Meir, when they fought, they were pluralists. No, Rabbi Akiva said, I'm right. And Rabbi Meir said, and I'm right. Now the Talmud then came and said, and we have to learn them all, which is beautiful. That's the, the pluralism is in putting them on the same page, but it's not in Rabbi Akiva teaching both sides of the argument necessarily. No, he said to the students, here's how you interpret this verse, period. And Rabbi Mary said, no, here's how you interpret this verse, period. Sometimes we have these beautiful moments where they can hear each other. And of course, this is the fun, right? This is the beautiful trait of, of the school of Hillel, they, right? That they could teach the other side, which I think is such an important skill, Rabbi Wolby. And I, I think charging yeah. our 
you know, our constituents to do so is so important. But, but it's not that I thought you were right or that Judaism says both ways are right necessarily. No, I think Judaism says one thing and that's good. I think it's good to have positions, fundamental, moral, political, legal, societal positions that I deeply believe in and that I use Torah to have those conversations. We have to do that. Otherwise, Torah remains detached from our real lived lives, from our real lived issues and the things we care about. We have to be having these conversations with Torah. However, as Rabbi Wolby says and charges us, we have to have a lot of humility. We have to admit that there's another side. We don't necessarily have to teach it. I'm not sure we have to teach every side to every conversation. I'm not sure about that. But we have to admit that there is another side. And, and we also have to have lay people and communities and students and congregations that are educated and can swim in these texts and converse utilizing Torah so that they can know whether their rabbi happened to go over the cross a line and not actually say the full picture. And they could say, you know, Rabbi, it's interesting you say that because I actually learned yesterday a different Mishnah, which said the opposite. We, we, we want our congregants, I think, to be engaged in the conversation at that level. Thank you. Um, my 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 head is <laughs> swimming um, as I'm as I'm sure others is. Um, so I'm gonna you know just uh, you know go a little uh, you know go a little off script. We, you know we did get a you know a couple of questions in here and uh, you know there's you know and and it was actually related to something that I was going to you know talk about in the close or ask you in the close. Um, you know. Um, so the, 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 the person asks, um, do you think political divisiveness happening in our world today is an indication of something deeper that is lacking in our world and is just manifesting itself in political divisiveness? And if you do, you know, you know, on a base level, you know, what, what would you recommend that we reflect on, you know, over this coming uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur period? In other words, is, is this a you know is 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 this a symptom of something you know even uh, you know even larger? And I know we're going to be out of time in five six minutes, so I'm just also just going to throw in one other thing to think about, which is, um, you know, what what is the role of uh, of 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 the people on this call? You know, and 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 what I mean by that is like I I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to call all of us leaders. Um, and I'm using that descriptor in, in, in the widest sense because I, I believe in it, right? You know, like who speaks for the Jewish people? Well, we all we all do and should. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm interested to know if there's just, you know, you can pick one of these or both these, like, you know, what's our responsibility in all of this? And, you know, is this is this event a once a year event or should this event right now be a once a week event? Um, you know, and, and the articles should be, should there be every issue or there should be every week of every issue, you know, so I, I'll, I'll leave you to play with that for the next uh, five, six minutes between the two of you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's a great question what we're lacking in our world today. Um, you know, I think it's easy to point to some things. Um, I, th I think that there's a lot at play. One thing that I think is happening, which I've already said, so I feel like I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but I think we have allowed ourselves to dehumanize. It's a very strong word, but I think it's true. The other side, you know, in preparation for this, I'm gonna quote you Rabbi Wolpe, we didn't talk about this, but in preparation for this, Rabbi Wolpe said so brilliantly, uh, you know, when we talk about this conversation, everyone's like nodding along, like, yes, yes, we have to be humble. Yes, yes, we have to hear the other side. We have to, we have to, and really what we're talking about is the other side needs to hear us, right? That's usually what we're thinking. So sorry, I'm quoting you there, I won't be, but I think no. it's so it was so beautiful and it really helped me think yeah. about this. Um, but but I think that there's there's a way in which we decide we're right and the other side is wrong and, and there's nothing there's nothing we can do to get past that. I will just say, not that I want to necessarily be this person, but I will just say, I do think social media and allowing ourselves to have these conversations through screens rather than face-to-face, -face, it's a lot easier to demonize 120 characters on a screen than it is to demonize, we hope, the person sitting next to me at the Shabbat table. So how are we making sure that we're having these conversations and seeing people in the, in the depths of their humanity and their human dignity? I think that's something we're missing right now. Um, sure. In terms of what, Sorry, just in terms of what, no. what, um, 
what, what the people on this call can do, I think, is to keep having these conversations, convening these conversations, and really forcing ourselves to be uncomfortable, to have the conversation with the other that we disagree with, have that conversation, and, and get to it, really get at it, not, not decide to talk about what soup we're having at, you know, this Rosh Hashanah, but actually get to the things we disagree about and see our humanity in those moments. I, I want to pick up on exactly that point because I think that the reason the pandemic made it worse, I mean, as, as there are, again, there are a thousand factors and people say, well, like, re politics is the new religion, but actually among religious people, I see politics being just as divisive as among non-religious people. So I'm not sure that that's a sufficient diagnosis, but, but we have many, many, many fewer venues for people to encounter each other. It's like, remember bowling alone? it's bowling alone on steroids. People don't see each other in basketball games, at the GCCs, and at, at, at sporting events, in synagogues, on all the places we always used to convene so that we don't interact with someone. And then you find out like a year down the line what their politics are, but you already have a relationship to them. So you think, okay, so this guy's misguided on politics, but I know him, he's a good guy. I, just, I, I like his family and so on. And the, 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 so the politics have usurped human relations and human relations should be the priority. And I think that that's actually deeply um, rooted now, especially with social media, because that's how so many people interact. Uh, and, and I mean, when you, when, when you find someone, and I've done many marriages off, off social apps, but when you find someone to date off a screen, instead of sitting and talking to them, it's a very different social orientation. And, and although it may be helpful, there are parts of it that are really not healthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. I know there's a couple of other comments that have come in and I know that uh, Andre's wanted to respond to, uh, you know, to one of them and then probably take us to the closeout. So um, I'll,